dealt with this. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to go over the, uh, the new features added in 0.10.1 and 0.10.2, uh, the last couple of releases. Um, so, so these are the main features I'm going to try and show. Um, there's the new package manager, which is uh, called PSC package. Uh, there's a new mode in PSCI, the interactive mode called paste, uh, which changes the way uh, that you paste into sort of multi-line commands. I'll go over that. Um, there's a new piece of syntax, uh, like syntactic sugar, called access chains. So I have a little demo for that. Um, there's two types of new type deriving, um, generalized new type deriving, like Haskell has as an extension. Um, and then deriving a type class, which is called new type. Uh, so you know, they, they have the same name, but there's two different uh, types of new type deriving I can go over. Um, there's a new feature to dump out the functional core as JSON, which can be used to implement new backends and various uh, you know, passes over the, the functional core. Uh, so I can give us a quick demo of that with some uh, sample code or something. Um, there's the type directed search feature, uh, which Christoph has been working on. Uh, so he probably has a better demo than I could uh, give of that, but I have, a, I have a quick demo I can show. Um, and then there's functional dependencies and generic rep deriving, which sort of go together. So um, this is a new uh, type system feature, uh, which enables a whole bunch of sort of uh, neat library, uh, uh, neat, neat types of libraries. And this is one example of something in core, in the core library set that's, that I've been working on, uh, which is a new style of generic deriving. Okay, um, so I think there's a question with docu uh, sorry, there's a document with questions here as well on Google Docs. So I'll try and go through these as well. Um, if you have any questions, you know, just add them here. I'll just stop me. You know, uh, we can go through that stuff. Okay, yeah, awesome. All right. So uh, yeah, the first one is uh, PSC package, right? So this is um, it's brand new as of uh, ten point two. So uh, it's pretty experimental right now. Uh, should continue to use Bower uh, for most library development, but you can try this out uh, and, and give feedback. That would be good. Um, and the idea is that if it works out and we like this way of uh, developing, then we can eventually try and replace Bower and sort of integrate this with things like Pulp and Pursuit. Um, and then, you know, we can, because we're, we have this under our own control and we control the registry and all these things, then, you know, it's easier for us to add new features going forward compared to things like Bower. Okay. Um, so the way PSC package works, I can show you this terminal here. Uh, so the way it works is uh, there's a package set. You need you need uh, something called a package set, and there's a standard set of packages that's uh, defined uh, that contains all the core libraries and, and various libraries that people contribute uh, on GitHub. Uh, and there's uh, each uh, sorry, a package set is basically a Git repository. Uh, and you can have various tags of that Git repository, so at any time you're sort of pointing to a specific tag. And the package set can be used to resolve uh, versions of particular libraries um, that you want to pull in as dependencies. Okay, so let's give a quick demo. Uh, so I have this directory uh, that I'm using for my demos. So I'm just say PSC package init. Um, and it'll say that it's in initializing a new project, and by default it'll just pull in uh, the prelude from the current package set. Uh, so if we look at uh, PSC package.json, this is like the package configuration file. Uh, it has a few things. So it has a pointer to the Git repository that has the package set we're interested in. So this is the default PS script package set that has all of the core libraries and things. Um, it names a particular tag. So you, this could be a Git SHA, or you know, it could be a SHA hash of a, of a commit, or it could be a branch name, or whatever. Uh, but this basically points to a revision inside the package set repo. Um, and it, it basically will go and clone this package set locally, so it can use it to resolve various things. Um, it has a package name, and it has a list of dependencies, which right now is just the prelude. Okay. Um, so if I look, so all of the sort of uh, local package database is kept inside uh, this .psc package directory. Okay. So it has uh, one subdirectory for every uh, package set repository that we want. Uh, or rather, uh, sorry, every package set version that we're interested in. So uh, I can look inside here. Uh, and then in, in here I'll have, uh, actually there's, there's a sort of a hidden directory called dot set, which is a clone of the package set tag itself. Um, and that has uh, in particular uh, this packages.json file that we're interested in. Um, 
and, and that is basically just a giant JSON file that sort of uh, contains all the libraries in the package set and their dependencies. Um, and the repositories that you should clone them from with the, the tags uh, that we're going to use. And the idea is that all of these versions of these packages are going to, build, going to be able to build together. And this is all verified by uh, Travis. Okay. Um, so now I can say something like uh, PSC package. Uh, well, first of all, I can say, I can say build, right? And just build the stuff in, inside my uh, local package database. Uh, and if I want to install something new, uh, I could either modify the, uh, the package file myself, or I could say something like uh, install. So let's say if I want to install uh, PSCI support, for example, it will go and pull in all the transitive dependencies for PSCI support, okay? And they're going to now be uh, listed as subdirectories cloned under this, uh, under this package set directory locally, okay? And I can say PSC package build and it'll just build the new stuff, okay? Um, so that, that's basically it. There's a couple of extra uh, commands. You can say PSC package uh, help, and it'll show you the commands that you can use. You can initialize, you can update, which is just basically syncing whatever's in the package file with uh, what you have in the local package database. Um, I already showed install and build, and there's a couple of extra commands uh, that are kind of handy if you're doing uh, uh, developing libraries, so you can say something like PSC package dependencies, and that'll give you a, a list of all the transitive dependencies, right? not just the ones in the, in the package file, but you know everything, including dependencies of dependencies and so on. Um, and you can also say uh, sources, and this will give you a list of uh, all the source directories for all the active packages that you, you have in your uh, database. Um, so this can be handy if you want to sort of drop into PSCI or something. Hopefully this will be used by uh, Pulp later on to script some of these things. Um, but for now, uh, you know, we can still use things like PSCI. We just have to basically do things manually on the command line, right? like saying, uh, go inside the uh, package set subfolders, right? And for every version, get the source directories. Go find the first files, and then we can drop into PSCI this way. Okay, so things are a little bit more manual than they ideally would be right now, uh, but we'll, we'll sort of build out uh, the support for these things over time if it, if it proves that this is sort of a useful way of doing things. Um, right, so any questions on, on that so far? Yeah, I got one question. Um, I'm just curious about like where the, in, the, the ideas for the design of this come from. You, I think I heard that they come from like the hackage or stackage or something in the Haskell world. Um, are, yeah. are you, are you, are you uh, just kind of copying all the same designs and putting it in the PSC package? I mean, to a certain extent, yeah, it's, it's based quite a lot on stackage um, and stack. So the idea, well, I mean, I guess one, one difference is that uh, I'm trying to sort of rely quite heavily on Git, not necessarily GitHub, but um, I, I'm trying to base everything around, around Git. So the package set itself is just a Git repository. It gets cloned. Each package is a Git repository, and you point to it using a, a, a repository URL and a shell hatch. So the idea is that we can easily mirror these things or we can have alternative package sets which are forks of other package sets or if companies want to maintain their own internal package sets using an internal set of Git repositories, then they can do that too. Um, not to say that we can't do that with Stackage. Uh, I'm not actually familiar enough to say how you would do that with, with Stack, but, um, but that's, that's, one possibly, well, that's one possible difference. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I'm sort of basing this on, on on stack and stackage. We, we use that for the compiler uh, and it works out really well. Um, this might not be, um, it might not be the best for all workflows, but uh, you know, it's, I think it's gonna work out quite well for, for most of them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I've yeah. got two questions. Well, okay. One is, is uh, the sets, are they, so you're gonna know that all the packages work together in the set, is that right? Right, so what happens is um, if you want to add your library to the package set, then you just send a pull request, um, adding a little bit of JSON with the yeah. dependencies and, and tags and all that stuff. Um, and then the, the Travis job is going to go through, um, make sure everything builds together, and then later on it will do things like building documentation and all these things, running test suites, etc. Um, and the idea is that we're going to try and use continuous integration to try and make sure that the package set is always, you know, Build, always builds uh, as a whole um, so that you don't have to worry about that as a library consumer. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's sold yeah. up front. And you're going to like sort of, because I guess if it gets larger and larger, is that a worry? You know, in terms Yeah, um, I mean, you know, we'll sort of deal with that as we get to it, I suppose. But um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right now, I mean, there's, there's sort of 120 packages in there or something, so it's not all that oh. many, but it's a, yeah. it's a decent number and, and it seems to work pretty well. The cool. Travis job takes, uh, you know, a couple of minutes, but it uses, it caches everything pretty heavily, right? So it only tries to rebuild anything that changes. So if we change the prelude, you know, then it'll sit there for 10 minutes and rebuild everything. Yeah. Um, but if you change sort of one of the leaves of this dependency tree, right, then hopefully it's just doing a quick rebuild and it should be done in a minute or so. Um, so. And then yeah. Suppy asked, uh, can you show how to browserify a project? Oh, right. Uh, yeah, so, so PSC package doesn't actually support any of that stuff uh, out of the box, um, it, but it has this sources command. So the idea is that something like pulp would uh, hopefully eventually sort of provide the ability to take the output of this and pass it off to, uh, well, initially the compiler, right? Um, and then pipe it into something like Browserify. Uh, but you can do a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, ultimately this is just passing command line arguments through to the compiler, right? So we can do all the stuff we can do now uh, without pulp, like, uh, you know, it just puts the output in, in the output directory, right? So we can pass this to Browserify ourselves. Um, so ultimately, it'd be nice if we could get Pulp to you know, change over to using PSC package. Um, and then Browserify would just be the same as it is right now, right? Just be Pulp Browserify. But, but you know, until we get to that point, it's a little more manual. Cool. Thank you. All right. Any more questions on that? Uh, well, I'll carry on. OK. Um, so the next one is this, uh, this is a pretty small change, but it's, it's quite handy for tutorials and, and just general usability of PSCI. Um, so previously, PSCI would work in one of two modes. It would work in single line mode, which is the regular mode, or multi-line mode, and you couldn't switch between the two at runtime. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to work through the book and you wanted to paste things in to test them out in PSCI, then you'd have to start the whole section up in multi-line mode and then all of your single lines, you'd have to sort of remember that you're in multi-line mode, right, and terminate them after every command, which was not intuitive. Um, so now, uh, with, with the latest compiler, um, we basically always run in single line mode, um, but you can switch into te multi-line mode temporarily by using this paste command, okay? Um, so let me start at PSCI again, okay? Uh, so if I input the prelude. Uh, so an example of this, if I just drop into uh, multi-line mode using um, the paste command, you'll see uh, the, the sort of prompt changes to this ellipsis. So I, I know I'm in multi-line mode, okay? And now I can just start, I can either just paste something, uh, you know, from a, from a tutorial or something, or I can just start writing it function definitions using multiple lines. So let's say I want to write a GCD or something. Okay, uh, let's see. So obviously you still need to get the indentation right, right? But if you're pasting from somewhere, then that shouldn't be an issue. Um, I can just enter my, my definitions now. Uh, let's see, so uh, GCD of M and N, if N is bigger, then I want to do the GCD of N minus M and M, keep the smaller two. Otherwise, it's going to be GCD of N and N minus N. Right, and then when I'm done, I can just say, uh, I can just use Control D to terminate that, and it goes back to single line mode. Okay, um, and I can say, what's the type of GCD? Let's say GCD of, sort of 20 and 24 or something, um, <clears throat> and it works as before. Right, so I can sort of alternate between single line mode and multi line mode using this command. Just paste things in there. Uh, which is a lot more intuitive, I think, than uh, what we had before. So this is a pretty small change, but I think it's uh, pretty handy, generally. It sort of improves the usability of PSCI quite a lot. Uh, yeah, so any questions on that? Again, that's pretty straightforward, right? No, that's cool, yeah. That's really good for learning, for sure. That's all good. Yeah. Yeah, in uh, the past, when I had to define a complex function, I had to make a file and then define the complex function and then like import the file into PCPSCI. That was the best way I found to do it before. 
Um, but you said that there's a, right now there's like a multi-line mode that you can start PSCI in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you just, I think the flag's called, you know, double dash multi-line mode or something. Um, so you have to start it with that. So it's not terrible, but uh, it's pretty cumbersome. I, I don't really like it, so I, I much prefer to use this. Um, so yeah, hopefully it'll be, you know, pretty helpful. Uh, are there any plans to drop the let? Yeah, um, so we've talked about getting rid of this uh, before. It's not ideal. Like it'd be nice if you, you know, in a tutorial, you typically would just start here, right? And you just want to paste this in. Um, and it's not great because you have to take the example code and sort of indent it all by four characters or something. Um, so I think we probably would like to get rid of the let. Uh, it's always been a bit of a pain because it makes parsing slightly more ambiguous, right? Uh, you have to sort of like look ahead to figure out that you've talk, you, you're writing a declaration here rather than an expression. Um, but one nice thing with this paste mode is that because we're in paste mode now, we could say that the behavior is different in paste mode, right? Paste mode is, you know, you're pasting declarations or something. Um, so that, that's a sort of interesting option. And I might, I might try that and say that in paste mode, we're always pasting declarations, so you don't need the let. Um, right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we'll see. Maybe in the next release or something, we can, we can try that idea out. That's not okay. reasonable. Yeah, because I, I don't think typically you want to sort of paste expressions in here. I mean, it's possible, but it's more common that you want to sort of enter paste mode, paste a bunch of declarations, go back to single line mode, and then start experimenting with uh, with the expressions, right? Uh, but we'll see. We can try both and see how we like it, I suppose. Okay. Uh, so the next one is uh, accessor chain. So this is uh, a little bit of syntactic sugar. Uh, that I quite like. Um, actually, I want to open this in a new tab, I think. Okay. Um, so just to demo this quickly, like I've got a couple of type synonyms here. Person has a name and an address, and an address has a city and a state. And there's an example. Um, and then I'm rendering uh, the results of pulling out the name uh, from the example, okay, just spell. Um, so we already have this syntax, right? This obviously here I could have just said example.name, but I want to, to show that we have this syntax where we can build a function uh, from a property name. Uh, so this is called an you know accessor syntax or uh, whatever. But uh, so the, the new feature is that uh, we can now make chains of these things, right? So I can say I want the city, uh, Los Angeles. I can just pull that out by saying underscore a sort of anonymous function argument dot address dot city. Okay. Um, so this can be kind of handy if you're using things, if you want to do sort of updates on, uh, on deep structures, sorry, or, you know, get data from deep inside a structure right, that's made up of records. So what I would quite like here um, that we don't have right now uh, is the ability to say something like, you know, uh, to overload the update syntax, right? If I want to say update city using a function, um, well, that will be, uh, record update where I'm updating address.city uh, to start uh, to uh, I guess mm, I can't I can't be quite as point free as I want to be here but um, it might be quite nice to say something like uh, x.address.city right? and then uh, have this overloaded notation for updating a record you know, deep inside the record. Um, so we don't have this right now, obviously this, this fails to pass. We can do, uh, we can do this, that's fine. Um, so this is a sort of, an, this would be a nice extension, I think. Uh, but for now we have this syntax just for the getters. So I think this will be quite handy. Um, this would be even nicer, especially if we're dealing with things like lenses. Um, but maybe something to think about if anybody's interested in contributing to the compiler. Be a nice first first uh, pull request, I think. Uh, so, any questions on that? That was another one that's pretty basic, I think. No. Okay. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the next one is uh, new type deriving. So as I was saying, there's there's actually two types of new type deriving we can do. Now. Um, there's new typing in the style, new type deriving in the style of Haskell. Uh, so that one, uh, 
looks like this if we have a new type. So for example, a, you know, an email address, new type that wraps a string. Uh, and we want to derive an instance based on the instance for the underlying thing. Right? So let's say we want to show by just showing the, uh, the string inside. And we could do it this way, right? We could say pull off the email address constructor and show the string inside. Um, but you know, you're sort of paying a, a there's a cost here, right? That you have to sort of un, unpack uh, the new type when really, you know, the new type representation is the same as the string. So why can't we just use the why can't we just sort of coerce the dictionary for the new type, right? So um, now you can you can just say derive new type instance. Um, and it does sort of what you expect. So it takes the dictionary for string and it lifts it up to a dictionary for email address. Um, and you can do this with uh, sort of more interesting things as well. So like, let's say, uh, what's a good example? Um, control state trans, is this the name? Yeah, okay. Uh, so let's say I want to build like um, a minor transformer, okay? Uh, so I can say something like new type. So my my application monad um, is you know it's a it's type constructor um, and it's built out of let's say state t and I need a state type. So maybe that's a string uh, or let's say it's an integer or something. Um, and I need a, an underlying monad and that can be uh, accept of string. Okay, applied to a. Uh, doesn't like that. But that's okay. And do that. Um, so previously, I'd have to go through and sort of derive functor, reflective monad, blah blah blah. Um, well, now I can just say uh, you know, it's a functor. And this should work. Uh, no type class instance was found for that. Uh, really, that's very surprising. Um, Pretty sure we have that instance, but okay. Well, I'll take a look at that and figure out why that failed. That one's failing. To, oh, right, because it's a type synonym, of course. Right, okay, so I guess you have to be uh, pretty explicit here. Uh, with, a, with a type synonym, just like all the other types of deriving right now, you know, it doesn't quite work. But if I make this, uh, if I use uh, the explicit version here, then I think this is going to work. Identity. All right. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I can derive a uh, functor like this. I can derive uh, apply. Uh, oops. Apply. Derive applicative. Oops. And all the rest, right? Find. See, this is where I'm having sort of the a lot of these type classes, refined hierarchy sort of gets in the way a little bit, right? And we can also derive things like monad state um, for uh, integer, right? uh, and it's fine with that too. And then, so now, you know, just sort of, what, eight lines, I have a monad transformer stack with all of the instances that I need to be able to use this, right? And I can uh, export the type, but now I export the constructor, and now I have, you know, a very quick way of building a DSL. Um, so, so this can be quite handy in general. So that's one type of new type deriving. Uh, the other one is deriving the class called new type. So um, that looks like this. So we can say derive uh, instance uh, new type email address uh, for the class new type, and it has two arguments. So for the first argument, you just give the thing that is the new type, and the other argument is going to be um, Oops, the, the type inside the new type, but we don't write it that way, we just write an underscore and basically let the compiler figure it out. Okay. Uh, it doesn't know what that is, but that's fine. We can, uh, we can derive that. Okay, so, so this is basically um, you know, a type class that we use to capture all of our types, which are new types. Okay. Uh, and it comes with um, two functions. It comes with a wrap function and an unwrap function. Okay. Uh, so wrap takes the thing inside the new type and wraps it up as a new type. Um, and unwrap takes uh, whatever the new type is and unwraps it. So in this case, it's taking an email address and unwrapping it into a string. Okay. Um, so we can do things like, so there's a variety of sort of uh, neat things we can do with, with this new type class. So um, 
it, it sort of abstracts over uh, the new type so that we can say things like um, there's variants of things like fold map and traverse and, and various functions like this where uh, we can go inside and sort of unpack uh, the new type before and after, um, which makes dealing with things like additive and you know, all these all these various monoid new types a lot a lot simpler. Um, so I won't give a demo of that. The the repo for for the new type library has plenty of examples uh, in in pursuit, I think. So uh, let's see. So this is the library PureScript new type. Um, Here's, here's the type class, right? It's defined in terms of unwrap and, and wrap. Um, and then the interesting functions that I quite like are like this ally function, right? Which has a fairly complicated type, but it lets you say things like, um, you know, you can read it like fold map ally additive. Right? Um, and then that gives you a way of folding up a list of uh, integers additively, right? So one, two, three, four would fold to give 10. Uh, ordinarily here, you'd have to say fold map and then Build, at, build the additive constructor into your fold function, and then when you are done, run a sort of get additive or something to pull the results out, right? But this sort of does the wrapping and unwrapping for you, which is quite nice. Um, and then ala f is the same thing where we can do uh, uh, things like uh, traverse, I think, uh, with this ala f function. Uh, there's a bunch of other little functions that are quite handy when you want to sort of uh, abstract away this packing and unpacking. Okay. Um, yeah, so any, any questions on either of those two? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to clarify, well, not clarify, but kind of reiterate what this is to make sure I have the better, I have the full understanding of this. So the, there's a derived new type, like this new syntax which was added, and that's useful if you uh, already have some new, new types defined. So, and then you can make instances of the underlying type of that new type by just adding the derived new type keyword before that instance. Right. And then the other type of new type change was uh, kind of like a library thing, right? It's a it's a, it's a right. class, um, and I, I'm not quite clear on when you when all those things would be useful. Uh, do you have to? Uh, so if if you if you are using a bunch of new types in your project, then like it's it's a no brainer. You you better go look at this new type li uh, library and start using the functions in there. I think uh, yeah. So first of all, there's two features here, right? There's, there's this feature, like you say, and there's this feature, and they are completely separate. Uh, it's just they happen to sort of have the same name because the naming isn't very good. But um, yeah, for the second one, I would say if you have a new type and it's got, you know, it's a wrapper around something relatively straightforward, then just derive the new type class. Um, like, so even here, right, I, if I had this, I, I would still, um, I would derive a new type for like app A, right? Uh, and let the compiler figure this out. Because, uh, you know, this, this type class can be really handy. Right. So if, if you can derive it, I would say just derive it um, because it, it's just so handy in general. Right. Um, yeah, so I think we can say things like uh, test is uh, a la app traverse. Traversable. Um, oh, it won't give me the type signature, will it? Uh, oh, maybe I can do it like this. Hmm, never mind. Uh, so, yeah, the, you know, the, there's useful things that you can do with these, with, the, with this instance, right? So I would say if you can, if you can derive it, just derive it, um, and then see what useful functions you can get for free, or at least make it available to your library consumers, right? to your users. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, you're still talking about uh, the, this new type, uh, type yes. class, right? And you can derive that one and it'll uh, fill in the, uh, the, okay. All right. Yeah, so yeah. you get an intuition for like when you might want to use it. I, I would say derive it if you can, but if you want an intuition for why you, should, why you might want to use it, uh, if you have a new type instance, I would say just look through the documentation for this library. Uh, and take a look at some of these functions and the examples because they're quite good. Um, yeah, and you'll sort of get an idea for the sorts of, sorts of things you can do. Um, okay, let's go back here. Uh, yeah, and, and for this one, you know, uh, this is pretty much identical to the Haskell generalized new type deriving feature. So, um, you know, all of the 
all the documentation for that in Haskell so you know carries over here so um, I won't say much more about that one if, you, if you're interested in this I would say take a look at uh, the Haskell extension and that'll give you some intuition for why it's useful but it, you know it's just a sort of lightweight form of code generation essentially um, and a way of sort of if you have new types typically you want to use new types to hide um, implementation details like I say right we might expose this but not expose this data constructor so it gives us a nice way of sort of uh, building DSLs cheaply. Cool. I think Suppy had a question. Uh, okay. Can it derive instances for new types over records? Uh, Gary said it wasn't supported yet in 0.10.1. Right. Um, so you can't, uh, let's say we have a record in here. Right. I think this will fail, uh, first of all. So this will fail just, uh, so I need to, I would need to fix this anyway. Um, but I think it will, uh, yeah, okay. So this will get desugared into something uh, in which uh, this, this argument basically becomes a record, right? And we, we don't allow rows in uh, instance heads. So it's, it's gonna complain about that. Uh, but we have a way to get around that. Uh, we sort of just change this up, the behavior of the instance a little bit, right? Uh, if we were to write this by hand, we'd basically write something like uh, this. We have a new type for email address around something inside called inner. Okay. Uh, if we have uh, type equality between inner and the record. Okay. So this might look exactly the same, but uh, from a type checking point of view, it's not, right? So type equals, uh, I don't think I have... Maybe try pure script doesn't have this yet. Yeah, it doesn't unfortunately. Um, but this is this is a uh, type class that basically says these two types are equal. Okay, uh, and it lets you coerce between them. Um, so the reason this is different is that in the first case we were saying um, we can use this instance whenever we match um, either email address or. Uh, or string, right? Uh, sorry, when, when we match uh, email address, we can figure out that the, the thing inside is string. But this is saying um, we can always match we, uh, we can always match uh, the, the new type class against email address for any type. Um, but once you've decided that you're going to pick this instance, then you have to go and solve this type of quality constraint. Okay, so so the behavior of the solver is ever so slightly different. It's, it itself will commit more eagerly to this. Um, which, which means that we, we're not sort of casing on the record in order to determine whether we're using this instance or not. Right? We're always using this. We always will pick this instance as long as the email address matches, and then we'll solve the, the type quality constraint afterwards. So the compiler will accept something like this, where the, uh, where the uh, context can contain a record, but it won't let you sort of case on the record in order to decide um, whether the instance holds or not. Um, so we'll probably go with something like this and and, um, and to code gen you know instances like this uh, instead, and then the compiler would be happy, right? The, the alternative is um, that we just allow we just start to allow rows in instance heads whenever um, we're solving whenever the, whenever the record appears uh, on the right hand side of a functional dependency. Right? So I haven't I haven't talked about functional dependencies yet, but that's another way of sort of relaxing the type checker. Uh, and allowing these sorts of instances. So either way, we we have we have options and we have possible ways to allow these these instances. But right now, um, you know, we, we can't we can't derive those or even write them. Right. But um, but it'll it'll come in a future version pretty soon. Sorry. So the the the, the reasons are a little technical, obviously there, but uh, hopefully that answers the question. The short version is yes, it's coming, but we don't have it right now. Okay. Cool, thanks. Um, okay, any other questions on either of those two things? Otherwise, I'll... No, it doesn't look like it. All right, cool. So uh, the next one is uh, the ability to dump out functional core uh, as JSON, right? So I can probably just demonstrate this over here. Uh, okay, so I already built some of this stuff. Uh, I'm just gonna wipe out the output directory. Um, and I'm going to build this manually. Okay, so I, where's my PSC? I'm going to change my PSCI command to build with PSC. So we'll just do a quick test run of this. 
Okay, that seems happy, so let's delete that again. And now I'm going to build this time, but with the uh, dump core fn option. Okay, it'll do the same stuff. Um, but now if I go into the output directory and pick a module, so let's see what we have. Uh, so let's do like data.eat or something, just to pick one at random. Um, now we have a different set of files in here, right? We have all the old stuff that we had, so um, the compiled JavaScript, the foreign module, uh, the externs file that we use for incremental compilation. Uh, but now we have this file as well. This is uh, the functional core dump type as JSON. And you'll, if you look through here, obviously you'll have the same thing for each one of these modules. Um, so we can open this up and take a look. So it's not very readable right now, but um, if you were to format this, it'd be sort of semi-readable, right? But the idea is that it should be um, uh, possible by by code relatively easily, right? Uh, so this is a uh, this is a representation of the functional core as it comes out of the compiler midway through compilation, right? So after type checking um, and after elaboration, but before JavaScript code generation and optimizations. Okay, uh, so you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here, right? But it has a list of the imports. Oops. It has a list of the imports uh, that the module has. It tracks which version of the compiler it was built with. Uh, it has a list of all the exports for the module and then a list of all declarations, right? So uh, here, let's see if we can figure this out. So uh, eek is a declaration and it looks like it's a function. Um, so it's, it's a function from that takes an argument eek and builds an object literal uh, oh, okay, so so this is the uh, type class, uh, the the eek, the elaborated eek type class definition, okay, um, and then various other declarations, right? So so the idea is that you could write an alternative backend for pure scripts now much more easily, right? You don't have to fork the compiler. All you have to do is take this JSON um, and transform it into the language that you want to compile to, okay. Um, so it might mean that you have to re-implement some of the optimizations if you want those. Um, hopefully in the future those can be shared with the compiler and we can work on those things and figure it out. But now we have a much more lightweight, lightweight way of uh, writing new backends. Right? So I'm interested to see what people do. This is pretty uh, experimental right now. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to get feedback on it and see, um, see, you know, see what people think and uh, after people try it out. I should say uh, this was worked on by uh, Wright Fold from IRC. Right. So, um, you know, if you have questions about this, uh, maybe jump on IRC and we can talk about it there as well. But if there's anything I can't answer. Uh, okay. Uh, so basically opening CoreFun uh, to other languages in Haskell. Yeah, right, exactly. So you don't have to uh, fog the compiler in order to write a backend. You don't even have to write the backend in Haskell, right? You just have to be able to parse JSON. So like the entry, the, the barrier to entry for writing backends now is hopefully much lower, right? Uh, we can even write backends in PureScript uh, for other languages if we want to. Or, you know, new optimizing JavaScript backends. All these sorts of things are options. Um, if I use Haskell, I probably don't need that. Uh, yeah, if, you, if you're using Haskell, you still have the option of uh, forking the compiler. I would say that's uh, quite a bit more maintenance work though. I would probably try and use this if I could because you know over time we'll try and push optimizations uh, ahead of this, uh, this stage in the compiler so that you can benefit from optimizations uh, for any backend. Um, but yeah, that's, that's still an option. Uh, any other questions on this? All right, cool. All right, so the next one uh, is type-directed search, which uh, Christoph worked on, Chris Creek on IRC. So I, I really like this feature. I think this is super cool. Okay, so um, so the idea here is that we're extending the uh, types alls feature. Okay, so I have uh, a slightly different take on the example from before with people and addresses, right? Now I'm just representing things as tuples. Um, so it makes it sort of easier to demonstrate the feature here. Okay. Um, so a person, again, is a name and an address, and an address is a city and a state. Um, and I have a show person function that takes a person and renders it as a string, and an example, and I, I just render it here as, a, as an example. Okay. 
Um, so let's say that I want to write uh, a function that will turn the name into uppercase. Okay. Um, so in general, I might want to uh, just apply you know, a function uh, to, the, to the name component of a person, right? not necessarily the, the two upper function. Um, but that's what I'll use. So let's import that to upper. Okay. Um, and we'll write a, a higher order function. Uh, we'll call it on name. Okay. Um, and it will take a function from strings to strings and it will give back a function from person to person. Okay. Um, so I could just write this out by hand, right? Let's say tuple name address equals tuple of f name address. And this should be fine. Um, and then here I could say something like on name to upper. Oops, sorry. Uh, this, I suppose. Right. Or I could do something like this, maybe. Okay. All right, so this has modified the, the record before printing it. Okay, so the name is in uppercase. All right. Um, but let's say I, I hadn't written this. Okay. Um, so I could try and figure out what to do here by putting a typed hole. So we do that by saying question mark, and then we give a name, um, and then it will tell us the name uh, it will tell us the type that it inferred, right? But now, uh, in addition, it'll also do the search, right? So it'll say, uh, you, could, you can substitute the hole with one of these values and it will type check, right? So we can look through this and maybe there's something we could use, right? And uh, some of these will work and some won't. So I think LMAP will do what we want because it's mapping over the left, com left component of a tuple. So now we can just say, well, on name is just LMAP. Um, that's in by a functor. Okay, and this, this just does the right thing, right? Uh, so we saved ourselves some work there by, uh, you know, in fact, we could just, uh, we just inline this here, right? Um, we saved ourselves some work there by, uh, uh, by just letting the compiler figure out the term based on the type, right? So we're doing basic term inference here. We wrote the types and we, the terms are inferred for us. Okay. Um, or let's say I want to, uh, you know, map over the city. I want to turn the city into uppercase. Right. Um, so in that case, I could just say, well, what goes here? Right. Uh, and it will say, well, you have, you have a few options, right? So the, the function that I inferred was, oops, this isn't quite right, is it? Uh, <coughs> um, so oh, sorry, I need to write. That was slightly wrong. Um, so I'm not mapping over the name anymore. I'm mapping over the um, the address, right? I need to map a function of the address and then map something over the city component of the address. Okay. So um, instead of LMAP here, I'm probably going to use RMAP, okay? Which is the other side, the, the other function from by functor that I'm not using here. Um, and then in here, I could say, well, what goes here? And it will say, uh, well, you have LMAP and RMAP that obviously do two, two different things, right? One will uppercase the city, one will uppercase the state. So let's do uh, city. Um, and now it uppercases the city. Or the other way we could have done this is to build this in like a lens style, right? And say, well, what's the sort of uh, the lens that goes here or you know, structure editing combinator or whatever, whatever, sorry, semantic editor combinator or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, and it will give you all these sort of lensy like things, lens like things, right? So, you know, first and second, LMAP, RMAP, map, et cetera, right? Um, so I suppose I could just use map here, couldn't I? Map here, uh, to lower. And that will, okay, yeah, cool. So that'll change the states into lowercase. So it's a nice tool for sort of discovering, um, you know, uh, functions that you might not previously have known about or new techniques. Um, so yeah, I, th I think this is really cool. And like, uh, there's a lot of work we can do to sort of uh, extend this. So um, one thing I'd quite like to do, uh, you know, maybe, maybe if I have a, you know, a typed hole here, 
I don't necessarily have something that directly fits into the types hole as a direct replacement, but maybe I have a function that uh, if I applied the function to an argument, it would be a, a replacement, right? So maybe that's called foo. And I can replace the type hole with, you know, the function applied to a new type hole. And I can sort of write my program by uh, iteratively refining and solving these sub goals and sort of reducing down to smaller and smaller problems, right? Um, so, so Christoph has some nice demos for this. And uh, it, one place where it's really useful is um, in defining sort of DSLs, right? So if you construct your, uh, your, your domain-specific language in a, in a good way then um, and sort of make the right functions available, then the users of your DSL can use this to sort of discover the parts of the DSL that they don't know about right, and help them write their code. So maybe if you have a database with various tables and functions to sort of pull things by primary keys or access things and join tables together, you can define all those functions. Um, and then the users can sort of discover your API uh, in a type-driven way, right? They can write, you know, they can write the type of the thing that they want to pull out of the database, and then use type tools to go and figure out how to get it. Um, so that's that's about all I have to say about that for now. Does anybody have any questions? Have any questions on here? Uh, just use on name. Uh, just use on name. Oh, I think he's referencing to the bit you were doing before. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> no, I really like that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I think this is a really cool feature. I think this is probably like one of my favorite things in Point 10, honestly. Um, and like I said, there's a, lot, there's a whole bunch of cool stuff we can do going forward as well. Yeah, we'll have to another, find it. Another enhancement that we can do is suggest, uh, you know, I don't know if you noticed this when I, uh, when I demonstrated this before. So if I put a type a typed hole here, um, some of these are really useful, right? Like this one would work, this one would work. This one would work, but it's not really a very good solution, right? It would just replace the name with an empty string. Uh, I'm not really sure what this one will do, honestly. Uh, and these are obviously pretty useless, right? So um, one thing we can do is to sort of score uh, various things, either make things into special cases and say, you know, unsafe course just isn't a very good solution ever. So we're going to give it a very low score. Same for crash, right? And then we can also look at things like how polymorphic something is. So, um, or rather, how many uh, how many type classes we maybe we'd have to instantiate in order to get uh, a solution, or how many things we'd have to unify, or you know, how, just generally how close the type is to matching, right? How many steps away? Um, so maybe MMT would be you know quite far away, but first already has sort of enough structure here, right? Like there's, there's a function in here at least, right? Um, we still have to instantiate a type class, but we don't have to sort of uh, instantiate this, this uh, M that's a very polymorphic thing in order to get, get what we want, right? So we can score these things in various ways and try and uh, move the sort of more likely stuff up to the top. So that's another way in which we can sort of extend this. So yeah, lots of interesting stuff here, I think. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, that would be super cool. Because then you yeah, definitely you know which one most likely to try out first. And yeah. I'd just be randomly typing them all in, hoping that. <laughs> <laughs> cool, good work. We'll have to try and get Christoph to, to do another demo as well. Yeah, I'm not sure where he is today. Usually he's on, right? But um, yeah. yeah, I know he has some good demos for this. So yeah. maybe next time we do one of these, we can, if we don't have anything else planned, you must have a life. And talk about this. Yeah, you must have a life this evening. That's what it is. <laughs> All right, so uh, functional dependencies, right? This one's a pretty big change. Uh, so this, this is a change to the type checker, uh, and it's uh, based on a, you know, the, the feature with the same name from Haskell. Um, but this is, this is pretty interesting, right? Because this is like the first, um, the first steps into sort of proper type level programming for pure script. Um, so it's not sort of GADTs or type families or all of any of you know, the newer features from, from Haskell. It's sort of like a, an older, uh, type level programming feature. But I, I think it's still very interesting and it fits in really nicely with uh, the features that we already have, namely type classes. Right? And it solves some existing problems that we had, like uh, inference being poor for things like uh, you know, MTL classes and, and these sorts of things. Um, so I'm really excited about this, right? So the way this works is uh, whenever you define a class with multiple, uh, multiple arguments here, uh, instead of them being completely unrelated, now you can define these functional dependencies, right? So you, you put a pipe character after the uh, type arguments to the class. 
um, and then you can sort of uh, write one or more functional dependencies. And it's, it's some type arguments followed by an arrow followed by some more type arguments. Okay. And the meaning of this is, um, you know, hey, type checker, if you can figure out these, um, the, the type, if you can figure out how to solve these type variables on the left of the arrow, then you can be sure that uh, you can commit to having solved the things on the right hand side of the arrow. Okay. So just to give a quick example of this, and there's a whole bunch uh, of better examples in the in the in the release notes, but you know more more interesting examples at least. But this one's fairly uh, concrete and, and short. Um, so here's a class uh, called Monofoldable. This is based on a library from Haskell called Mono Traversable, I think. Um, so the idea is that you know we want to fold over structures um, like you know using functions like fold map. Okay. Um, but then we have data types like string, which is, isn't a foldable structure, right? It doesn't even have the right kind to be foldable. Right? It's not a container. It, but, but then it is sort of like a container of characters, right? So it'd be nice if we could fold over the characters inside the string. But the existing type classes don't let us do that. Um, so instead, we have this monofoldable class, right? We can say that string is monofoldable, uh, and it has elements of type char. Okay? Um, and monofold map is just defined by using fold map on the character array that we get from the string. Okay. Um, so then we can define functions like mono length. Okay. And we can say, if you have some monofoldable thing uh, of type A and it has elements of type L, okay, then you can give me an A and I'll give you the length of the thing, i.e. how many elements it has. Okay. Um, and the way I'll do it is to just use monofold map um, by folding, you know, the, you know, just counting one up for every element. Okay. Actually, we could, uh, could do this using uh, alloc, couldn't I? Let's try that. Uh, say alloc additive monofold map. And then there's going to be something that goes here. Uh, it doesn't like that for some reason. Uh, I think I can just say const one here. No? Hmm. Alla additive. Did I get these the wrong way around, perhaps? No. Oh, uh, well, never mind. Um, no big deal. Let's go back to the original version. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so we can say uh, we can count the length of any monofoldable container. Um, by using uh, monofold map using additive. Okay? And then I can sort of take this string and count up the characters using mono length and it'll print it out. Okay? Um, so let's try removing the functional dependency. Right? So this fails and it fails in a sort of really confusing way. Right? It says um, no type class instance was found for monofoldable for um, A and T4. Right? This is line 21. So this is here. So um, if we if we look at this, we can probably figure out why this would fail, right? So this is like saying uh, I have mono. I want to use monofold map, right? So obviously uh, I need to find uh, I I need some structure which is monofoldable. Okay. Well, monofold map uh, works over L and A, and I need to give it a function from L to M, and it'll give me back a function from A to M. Okay. Well. Uh, we can figure out what M is, right? We can we can probably use type inference to figure out that this is additive, um, and we can figure out what A is uh, because my function that I'm returning takes an A, and that will be the result of this thing. So that's probably A, but it's not really uh, possible to figure out what L is, right? So I know that I have to have some monofoldable uh, constraint satisfied for some L and A, but the problem is it's not the same L. Right? It's just some unconstrained L that, uh, that I haven't solved yet. Right? So, so figuring out why that was the error from this error message is sort of really not very simple. Right? And the only reason it's obvious to me is because I understand the type checker quite well. Right? Um, so it's not that you couldn't figure this out, but uh, it's, not, it's not simple. Right? But now we can say, well, you know, if, you can, if the type checker can figure out A, then it can be confident that it can commit to the element type, right? Well, why is that the case? Well, you know, a particular foldable structure 
only has one type of element inside it, right? You can't have a string that's a con you know, container for characters, and it's also simultaneously a container for other things of a different type. So if you know the container, then we know the element type. Think of it another way. We have a function from container types to element types, right? So you can think of it, think of this as like saying, uh, we have a function here. This is like saying, uh, we have a type level function that takes container types, let's call this container, takes container types to element types. Okay, so we can think of functional dependencies as capturing sort of functions at the type level. Okay, um, and you know this is invalid syntax, right? We, I'm, I'm sort of tempted to add this. Uh, some of the papers, the original papers on functional dependencies, talk about this syntax. Um, this would be quite nice because then you'd be able to say something like, uh, "Oh, I'd have a good example." But you can refer to this uh, in type signatures. Right? Uh, so this looks a little bit like type families or something, right? So we can do do some of the some similar things with this. Um, but anyway, so we can think of this as uh, giving us you know, something like type level functions, okay, captured in type classes. Um, so this is really powerful, and there's a lot you can do with it. It basically gives you sort of you know a, a sort of mini prolog style language in the type system, right? So um, so it's a, it's a very sort of simple way of doing type level programming, but but you can do a lot with it. So uh, Liam Goodacre, I think, already wrote sort of uh, you know a lambda calculus evaluator in the type system using this, right? So there's and uh, Bodil wrote uh, you know something for doing uh, type level type level arithmetic and uh, ty uh, you know length index vectors and all this cool stuff, right, in the type system by using this feature. Uh, so it's pretty expressive. Um, and I'm really interested to see what people do with it. Uh, and hopefully it doesn't get too crazy, right? too fast, we'll see. Um, right, but, but that's about it. Like I say, if you take a look at the release notes, there's a whole bunch of um, interesting examples in there. Uh, and I have another one actually next for the generic to rep stuff. Um, but for now, does anyone have any, uh, have any questions on this? Well, yeah, I've got a question. Um, so if I'm making a, a new uh, type class and it's got, like, I'm trying to figure out when I would need to consider, like, when do I have to start learning how to do with this functional dependencies? Because, uh, like, we don't have to have this functional dependency for this type class, but then that, like, restricts what, what we can do with uh, the type yeah. class, right? So you should be careful to add them, right? Like if you have a, um, well, first of all, like if you have a, a class that has multiple type arguments, right, then um, you should consider whether there's any of these functional relationships between the type arguments, right? Um, and so think about it carefully because if you fail to add one, then you'll have poor type inference. But if you add one where there shouldn't be one, um, then you'll end up with overlapping instances all over the place where there shouldn't necessarily be overlaps. Right. Um, so adding a, adding a functional dependency means that the type checker is more likely to com uh, to commit to picking an instance when it's doing instance resolution, right? Which can be a good thing because it means that type you know type inference gets better and error messages get better. But it can mean that it commits to too many things, which means you have overlaps. Right? Um, so you know it's an advanced feature, and we shouldn't really be writing a whole lot of functional dependencies all over the place, um, but if you have multi-parameter type classes, then you should consider whether it makes sense, right? And, and it only, the only way to answer it is to sort of think quite hard about the operations that you have and the instances that you, you could possibly write, and then to think whether it makes sense to, to have this functional relation, relationship between the type arguments, right? The other side of it, from a user point of view, is if you have a functional dependency, what does that mean as a user, right? So, for example, um, if we have, like, uh, the monad state class, right? Um, let's see. Let's say something like uh, get the state and put the state plus one or something, right? <coughs> Pardon me. Um, or rather, this is a bad example. Uh, here's a better example. Right. Um, that's not good. Uh, why does that have? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's just say we'll return the S as well. Right. 
Um, so the type here is like quite complex, right? It's uh, we have some monad, so for all m and the s. Uh, we have an. Is that it? Is that right? Um, oh, sorry, monad state s. Um, there we go. Oh, and yeah, s is a ring. Okay, so the type's quite complicated here. But previously, the compiler wouldn't have been able to infer this, right? Now we can just leave this off and it'll figure it out. Um, but in 093, it would have failed with sort of really confusing error message, right? Because it would have tried to figure this one out and it would have tried to figure this one out. But then, and you know, it can solve each of these things independently, but it doesn't know that the two s's that it gets are the same s, right? Um, and the functional dependency on monad state says if you know m, then you know s. Okay, so it solves m in both cases, and it, you know because they're related by do notation, they have to be the same thing. So because those two m's are the same, then the two s's have to be the same, and it's all okay, right? Um, <coughs> so as a user of libraries uh, with functional dependencies, the nice thing is you sort of don't have to worry about uh, you know type inference quite so much because the uh, the relationships between type, type arguments has been pushed up into the type class definition, right? Um, we can just sort of write natural code that looks, you know, the way you would expect. You don't have to worry about sort of putting type annotations all over the place. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, things that were previously, uh, you know, that previously needed type annotations like monad state, monad reader, all these types of things, uh, we don't, we don't uh, need to have those anymore. So hopefully as a user, using those libraries is much simpler now. Um, but also there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do as library writers that we couldn't do before. Right? Or at least if we wanted to do it before, it would have required lots and lots of type annotations. Um, so uh, that's sort of a partial answer. Hope that helps a little bit anyway. I think that's a really helpful answer. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so the last thing uh, is that actually an application of functional dependencies. It's another deriving mechanism, um, and it's related to this library called generics rep. Okay, so uh, you might have used the generics library before. Okay, your script generics. Um, so it has a type class uh, that says, uh, you know, a type is generic if you can turn it into uh, a generic spine representation. Okay, and you can turn it back from a spine. You can try and turn it back from a generic spine. Okay, maybe it fails if you have the wrong type of spine. Um, and you have a type signature uh, function that takes a proxy for your type and gives you a signature for that type. Okay. Um, and you can do various things like show generic data, you can test the generic data for quality, et cetera. Um, but there's, there's some issues with this API, um, and it, it's sort of really great for, you know, uh, for this, you know, the, the applications that we have, uh, you know, it's very, very handy, it sort of saves us a lot of time. Um, but there's some issues, right? And the issue is basically, you know, this is, this is sort of like uh, a little bit suspicious, right? Why, why do we need this maybe here? And the reason is, you know, this, this spine representation is untyped, right? There's, there's no type information in here that guarantees that when I turn something from a spine, uh, sorry, from a value into a spine, that uh, I can always uh, guarantee that the caller of from spine is calling sort of the same type of spine, right? It's the same type of generic data as what was created by two spine, okay? Um, and the reason why we couldn't do a nice typed representation was that you know maybe maybe we want to add a type argument here, right? So we'll say you know we have a you know a spine type argument or something, and we'll make this one the same so that we we know that we're always providing you know safe data or something. Then we have another argument here, right? So we have a multi-parameter type class, and what we really want to be able to say is the type of A determines the type of the spine, right? Not the other way around, right? It could be the case that you have the same spine type for different A arguments, but at least A determines the spine type. And without the ability to have that functional dependency, the type inference is really bad. Um, so GHC generics doesn't do it this way. Uh, it's sort of similar in some ways, but um, not really very close. So, um, so this generics rep uh, package, which is new, uh, has a, you know it's a different take on generic programming, which is based on GHC generics. What's going on there? Okay. So, so this is what it looks like. Right, you have a generic uh, type. Um, and it looks pretty close. We now have uh, two type arguments, right? Now we're trying to track the type of the spines, 
Okay. Um, so we have the, the type of the thing we want to make generic, and we have a representation type. And they're related by a functional dependency, which I guess Pursuit doesn't show functional dependencies right now. But if you go to the source, you know, it's right here. It says the representation is determined by the type, the generic type. Okay. Um, and then we have functions to go to and from the representation type. Right? We don't have anything like get signature because now the signature is actually just tracked at the type level by the representation type itself. Right. So if we want to reflect the representation type down to the value level, then that's an option, right? The library doesn't do that right now, but it's, it's possible to do that, okay? Um, so then, uh, in addition to the type class, we have sort of representation types, like a, a family of generic representation types that we can build our representation, representation types out of, right? There's representations for things that don't have constructors. There's representations for constructors that don't have arguments. There's representation, representations for products and sums, and constructors where we're tracking the name of the constructor in the type as a type level string, right? uh, arguments of constructors, records with multiple fields, fields labeled with a type level string capturing the, the name of the field inside the record, and all these things. Right? So for anything that's built out of sums and products, i.e. data declarations, and records inside those data declarations, um, then we can, do, we can come up with a sensible representation type um, and write an instance of generic. But the new feature in the compiler that goes with this um, allows us to actually just derive one of these things. Right? We can just say uh, derive instance generic blah uh, for generic A. And just like we did with new type, right? we don't have to explicitly write the representation type. We can just let the compiler infer it. And that's really good, actually, because these types get really large right? for, for large types. Um, so you don't want to have to write these things out by hand. So we can derive these things. right? Um, so then what, what can we do with these, right? Well, we can do all of the stuff that we used to be able to do with uh, the old generics, right? So we can derive eek, we can derive show, although I haven't actually implemented that one yet, but we can derive odd, right? So if we look at what eek looks like, um, so this, this follows the GHC generic style very closely, right? We have a type class that tracks the corresponding operation on the representation type, right? And then we say, well, if you have something that's generic with a representation, and the representation has generic equality on it, then I can give you uh, an equality operation for the original type. Okay. Um, and type inference for this uh, works nicely because the functional dependency allows us to infer the representation given the type A. Right? Notice that the representation doesn't actually appear in the type. Right? We only talk about A, but the compiler can go and figure out what the representation is because it has the functional dependency, and then go and figure out what the dictionary for this class is for the representation. Okay. Um, and the way this works is that we just let the compiler figure out the representation type and we provide instances for all of the generic representations. Right. So we can, do, uh, we can do generic equality testing whenever we have no constructors, no arguments, sums and products, records, constructors, all this, all this stuff. Right. Um, and we just build these instances in the, sort of the way you would expect, right? Products, you know, the, the instances for products says you have to be equal on both components. Um, the instance for sums has an instance to the left, an instance to the right, et cetera. Um, so we can do all this stuff that we used to be able to do with the original generics representation. Right? But the other problem with the original generics uh, implementation was that because the, the spine type was untyped, right, we had to write um, an implementation for every possible spine, right? Another way of thinking about it is that we only had one type of spine, right? That the one the one spine type had to sort of cover every single type, okay? Which means you had a sort of all or nothing property, right? If you wanted to derive something, it had to be derivable for every type, or you couldn't derive it at all, right? Which, if you look through uh, suit, you can find examples of things like uh, tabulate, right? Which are derivable but not for every type, right? So you have to have this sort of ugly stuff where, oh, I switched this to use generics, right? In the previous version, it used the old generics, right? Um, and you had to have like a partiality constraint on the, on the generic implementation, right? Because uh, there wasn't a better way of tracking the fact that this wasn't, this wasn't possible to derive for some types, right? If you had like number, well, you know, Testing equality and tabul you know, memoizing functions of numbers is, is a bit tricky, right? So I don't want to provide an instance for that, and I don't want to derive it. 
Um, so this is actually partial, and, and it's this is sort of not ideal, right? We want um, we want a way of saying I can derive this for certain types of generic data, for, but not for other types of generic data. And the generic direct approach sort of solves that really nicely. Right? Now I can say, just like we had for for the uh, eek example, uh, if you have some generic type and it has some representation which you can solve for, and the representation is tabulatable. Um, then you can write a tabulation function, right? But the key thing is I don't have to write the tabulation instances for every representation type. I just have to write instances for the ones where it makes sense. And then if you try and use gtabulate for some A for which the representation doesn't have a tabulate instance, then it's a type error. Right? So we've just pushed, um, you know, the, the solution, uh, we've, we've pushed the, the question of, you know, whether or not it makes uh, sense uh, to derive an instance for a particular type into the solver when we get to the point where we want to find a tabulate instance for the representation. Right? There may or may not be an instance. But now we can, unlike with the previous generic implementation, we can say, these types are tabulatable, these ones aren't, um, and then lift that, pull that back you know, from the representation to the actual generic types. Okay? Um, so specifically, if you look at the instances here, right? tabulate provides instances for um, you know, integer, but not the number. Um, and it provides instances for, you know, all of the term form, all of the type formers, like, uh, you know, lists and arrays and product sums, uh, constructors. Uh, it doesn't provide instances for records. Uh, it probably could actually, but, you know, this is quite nice because I can sort of, uh, I can incrementally add support for generic deriving, right? Right now, if I try and derive a tabulate instance for something with records in it, it won't work because I didn't write the instances. But if somebody needs that, then we can go and, we can go and add those. Right. Um, so I quite like this approach. Uh, it, you know, it has different trade-offs from the existing um, generics implementation, um, but it definitely provides some interesting benefits. And you know, I think we'll probably leave both types in there at least until 1.0, maybe later, and try and figure out which one's the best fit, um, and then probably just get rid of the other one. Right. Um, so that's about it. Uh, oh, right, so to make it a bit more concrete, we couldn't derive monoid or semi-group, um, but we can derive both of those now with the new representation. Uh, so to frame that as I just had it a second ago, um, it doesn't make sense to derive semi-group for sums, but it does make sense to derive semi-group for products. So now we only provide instances for the generic representations that are made up of only products and records. Um, so notice there's no generic semi-group instance for some here. Okay. Um, so, you know, trying to derive that will just be a type error. Okay. Uh, so that's basically everything I had. So um, any questions on any of that stuff? The quality testing when there's no constructors. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that might seem sort of counterintuitive, but... Uh, I mean, any two, any two type, any two values of a type with no constructor, you can just sort of consider to be equal vacuously, right? Uh, there's no values for which you can ask the, the question. So if you ask the question, I should be free to give you any answer I feel like, right? As Conor McBride would say, you can't complain about our shoddy merchandise since you paid with false currency, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Nice. Right, any other questions? No, I think that was it. Thanks, Phil. That was great. Cool. All right, thanks. Uh, oh, yeah, questions in the document. All right, let's see what that uh, is. Um, why are functional dependencies breaking new installations? Right, so that's kind of interesting. So, um, there were two things wrong with 0, 9, and 3. One was the lack of functional dependencies, and the other one was a bug, which made it so that code which shouldn't have type checked, which would be fixed by functional dependencies, was type checking. So we simultaneously added functional dependencies and fixed the bug, which meant that all this code with sort of, you know, monad state, et cetera, now uh, does the right thing but uh, some sort of corner cases which previously type-checked would fail to type-check unless you added the, the functional dependency. 
right? So this was a relatively strange corner case, but uh, basically if you update to the latest library versions, it should just fix everything because those have the functional dependencies. Okay. Um, we already covered this one. Uh, oh, I didn't really talk about type level string functions. Maybe I should talk about that really quickly. Um, so, yeah, I think the doc uh, in the release notes that was demonstrating that you can add a fail message if. Uh, right here. Yeah. yeah, so this is a nice little feature, right? Um, so we can. We, we, this was already in the compiler, right? This this constraint um, that said that was basically like a, a constraint that always fails, right? There's no instances for this for this type class. Um, so it gives you a way of sort of failing with a nice error message. Okay. Um, the extension. So this says, you know, if you try and solve show for a function, um, then you should fail with this type error message, right? Because we, we try and solve this sub goal and we never are able to solve this. But the compiler can provide nice rendering for this. Right. So um, the cool thing that was added in, in the latest release was uh, to add type level concatenation of symbols. Right. And uh, pretty printing for actual types as type level strings. Right, so now you have this tiny little DSL for building strings at the type level that you can use to provide nice instances, uh, nice error messages uh, for instances. Right? So you can say things like um, function type concatenated with print the string corresponding to the type A to B cannot be shown. Right? So it means you can embed the actual type as the compiler would show it inside its own error messages inside your user-defined error messages. Um, so again, this is one of those features that you probably don't want all that often. You, know, you, sh you shouldn't necessarily exclude users from writing instances unless you have a really good reason, right? Unless you really know that there's never going to be a case when uh, such an instance would, would be able to exist because of the laws or something, right? So, uh, you know, this one's a bit tricky, right? Is it is it really the case that we never want to show a function, right? Maybe if the, the domain of the function is enumerable, then we can tabulate it and show it or something, right? So you should always be a little bit careful to uh, to completely exclude instances, right? But if you have a good reason to do that, then you can give nice error messages and build them up using these uh, combinators, type-level programming combinators. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how can I help to update the library ecosystem to 0 0.10? Um, you can help by uh, contributing to PSC package and the package set development, I think. Right, so we already have uh, pretty much uh, all of, well, all of core and all of contrib is updated now for 0 0.10, and we have a package set that contains all of that stuff and a lot of other stuff too. Um, but there's at least half of the stuff on Pursuit which is not in the package set right now. So a really helpful thing if you wanted to contribute to this would be to go through Pursuit, find out which libraries are being most commonly used and, and help us to put those into the package set. Okay. And help test out that stuff too, right? Because we don't have a lot of uh, feedback on PSC package yet. So I think that would be really helpful to get. Um, all right, so I already said a little bit about uh, sort of extensions to these things that I'd be interested in seeing. Uh, I think I already talked about this and this. Uh, yeah, I think we're good, right? I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.